While I haven't had the chance to finish any play-by-email games in Dominions 5 quite yet, I did manage to finish a few Blitzes. This is a review of one of those games called Sunday Blitz, which is a four-player game in which I played Micklin. Now, Micklin uh, did not actually have any significant changes to its roster um, in the switch from Dominions 4 to Dominions 5. Uh, the only real uh, major change that they received is that uh, Twahula Puchis got a lot more expensive in that they went um, from just like 25 Blood Slaves, I believe, all the way up to 44. So the Assassin Mages are a lot more expensive to summon. Um, but they did get a lot of incidental changes just from the systemic changes from Dominions 4 to Dominions 5. So the two major changes which affected them are the recruitment point change and the bless overhaul. Uh, Miklin is a very bless reliant nation in that it relies both on um, recruited sacreds of uh, various kinds and summoned sacreds from um, their blood magic, namely the Ozolotls, and then they even have a bunch of sacred uh, regular summons in that they can get with nature gems. Um, as a result, Micklin's actually a really great nation to explore the new Bless system with. Um, from what I've seen, there's basically two different ways that you can play Micklin. One is to go for a more normal, positive scales oriented build, in which you rely more heavily on your Jaguar Warriors. So these are your um, any fort recruitable sacreds, and while their human form isn't anything impressive, they turn into a um, wear Jaguar once the human form is killed, and then they become extremely dangerous offensively, and it effectively also means that they have two pools of hit points. However, Jaguar Warriors uh, ha cost a lot of recruitment points, so whereas in Dominions 4, uh, you didn't necessarily need order in order to recruit them, you just needed to have gold, uh, in Dominions 5, you need order 3 in order to recruit them in um, significant quantities outside of your capital. So as a result, because you're taking order 3 and then need to... Um, spread your dominion uh, to all of your out-of-capital forts, you're basically encouraged to take positive scales in general. So that's what I would consider, I guess, a more normal Micklin build. It would have Order 3 for sure, and while you still can dump uh, Sloth because you don't actually need the resources to recruit Jag Jaguar Warriors, you most likely also want to get your income scales and magic scales uh, to be just generally good. So. Um, as a result, because you're uh, devoting so many more of your design points uh, towards your scales, you're most likely going to be taking um, either an imprisoned build with no incarnate bless, or a very minor or a relatively um, reduced bless. However, because the whole point of taking those scales is to recruit large number of sacreds, you're most likely going to want to do the first option. So that uh, build is going to have most likely an imprisoned rainbow pretender of some kind with all of the various bless points that you do get from the different uh, magics that you pick uh, to be dedicated towards improving your jaguar warriors and making them better at fighting. Uh, EA and LA Micklin, like they did in Dominions 4, um, don't naturally spread Dominions from their temples, so as a result you can take absolutely trashed scales um, and then selectively blood sacrifice in order to um, basically just prevent yourself from being dom killed and to reduce enemy dominion rather than uh, focusing on actively spreading your own dominion constantly. Um, so this was uh, probably the best build in Dominions 4 where you basically just took garbage scales and either a full quad bless or uh, my personal preference um, three major blesses and a minor fire bless and then you basically just had uh, the super sacreds that were extremely strong, and which you could afford because you simply didn't spread your dominion across most of your lands. So you were still getting income from the dominion neutral provinces that you controlled, while um, being able to recruit these awesome jaguar warriors with a huge number of blesses on them. Uh, in Dominions 5, uh, you no longer have that same um, method just because you can't recruit your jaguar warriors from outside of your uh, capital in uh, too many numbers, but you still can take very poor scales and then do the same thing where you control your dominion spread. Um, because you now have to take an Awake Pretender in order to get the best blesses, that also means that you have a little bit of base dom spread from your capital, which helps a little bit in spreading your dominion to prevent yourself from being just incidentally dom killed. Um, and you can use your Awake Pretender to research to get to Blood 4 as quickly as possible. And then once you're at Blood 4, you get to uh, summon the Jaguar Fiends, which are going to um, basically take over for your recruitable sacreds because you can still recruit the Micklin priests outside of your capitals, summon up uh, 
wolves and do the same normal patrolling blood hunting thing in order to get a, a, enough blood slaves to summon up the um, ocelotls, and then you still have a massive bless for the ocelotls themselves. Additionally, um, with the changes to flying make, or rather with the changes to targeting making attack rear more reliable, uh, eagle warriors and the ocelotls became much better at uh, expanding or uh, just fighting unprepared armies in general because they can more reliably attack rear. Um, Eagle Warriors have two attacks at size two, meaning that you can end up with six attacks per square, making them incredibly potent offensively. So um, an Eagle Warrior Bless is going to be focused on increasing their already great offense, um, which also is great for the Ozolotls, of course, because they also have a huge number of attacks. Um, so this is what we focused on with our Pretender. We took a Luck Bless, um, as our only defensive uh, bless, and then we have quickness, blood surge, strength, attack, and then plus morale. Um, I probably would have preferred to swap the plus morale for fire resistance in retrospect, um, but it doesn't really hurt to just uh, help make our guys uh, more resistant to routing. So quickness is now a water 10 bless, um, and that gives you uh, essentially doubled attacks rather than the previous um, one and a half times as many attacks. Uh, because the Eagle Warriors are extremely squishy with only 11 hit points and a very little base protection, Luck is actually an incredibly strong survival ability. It basically means that any time that they would be killed by damage, uh, they have a three quarter chance of surviving. So it's essentially a better ethereal in that three quarters of all the attacks which would kill them, which given that they have essentially no defenses is most attacks, uh, they can survive. So they are become almost four times as hard to kill as they are without this bless. And, and then everything else, like I mentioned, is offensive. So they attack twice as often, they um, are, 20, are uh, more likely to hit against the target with um, equal defense, it's like um, around 20% better, so that's just a huge increase to their overall damage. Uh, strength plus two is essentially always on. Um, and then once they uh, manage to kill someone, Blood Surge means that they get plus three more attack and strength. So that's like uh, almost like a Berserker thing, except instead of triggering when they uh, take damage, it triggers when they kill someone. And it also doesn't come with a defense penalty. Instead, it even comes with a defense bonus. Um, Eagle Warriors have Lances, which uh, give them a bonus to damage on their first attack. Um, the charge bonus is based on their combat speed, and Quickness actually doubles that as well. So essentially that means that they're going to do a huge amount of damage in their first attack, almost certainly kill something, and then that triggers their blood surge, which is going to increase their attack and damage even higher. So these things just become absolutely murderous with that bless, and um, with luck they're much more likely to survive the few attacks that they get um, launched back at them. Uh, and then, because we're so focused on these Eagle Warriors for both our expansion and our early wars, you can see why we named our Pretender the Eagle Aesthetic. Um, Eagles also got a really nice sprite update, so they look super cool now, um, now that they you know, kind of look like they're flying instead of just looking like they're wearing a cape. Um, and yeah, we'll be definitely seeing a lot of those guys, since they're going to be doing um, most of the killing for our uh, armies this game. Um, we're going to be profiting our scout and recruiting a uh, Nahuali. The reason that we're doing that is that the um, uh, Eagle Warrior production is limited by our Holy Points, which is limited by um, our Dominion. So uh, we can recruit a full seven Eagle Warriors if we don't recruit a Priest. Um, and then by profiting our scout, we still have someone to bless them. And the Nahuali can basically provide the 10 leadership required in order to uh, lead the Eagle Warriors around. We're recruiting these um, warriors basically just to round out our squad, and to, um, while uh, lures are no longer as effective, it's still helpful to basically have like a little troop anchor there that enemy squads can still latch onto so that they don't immediately turn around and start fighting the eagle warriors um, if they haven't made it very far away from the commanders. Um, the Nuahuali, if it survives uh, leading around the expansion party, can then become a sight searcher and uh, general um, nature mage to summon up our wolves and that sort of thing. Um, and for future expansion parties, we'll be recruiting one fewer Eagle Warrior and uh, recruiting a Mictlan Priest or one of the other priests instead to lead them around. 
Uh, the reason that we are using our um, starting army to blind expand is basically just that we don't need them. Um, we'll basically only be able to use these guys as troop anchors since the Eagle Warriors are going to be flying over the heads of the enemy army and killing stuff on their own. So um, if these guys are able to blind expand successfully, then um, you know, that's great, and we can get a free province out of them, and if they don't and they all die, that's also fine, because we don't actually need these guys for anything. So we can just get rid of a little bit of upkeep, um, and yeah, just attack whatever we think they have a chance of beating. Um, because the uh, Tribal King has 80 leadership, he allows us to use line formations, so we're going to be doing that and using the new Hold and Fire command in order to keep our stuff as far back as possible. The reason that this is beneficial is that... Um, while troop targeting is now uh, randomized, so it's no longer just latching onto the uh, very first enemy and then um, able to be lured by the positioning of that uh, of where we put that unit. Um, the indie units are still going to be moving at different speeds, so cavalry would be moving ahead of the infantry, light infantry would be moving ahead of the heavy infantry, and so on. So having our guys set to the very far back end of the battlefield um, is basically going to spread the enemy troops out by as much as possible, um, and it's also going to make it so that um, enemy archers are going to need to get closer before they can start shooting. Um, because all these guys have slings, they're going to basically be able to get in some shots on the enemy uh, while they're closing. Um, and then once the enemy does close in, then we have our slightly more heavily guide armored or our slightly more heavily armored guys in the front, um, who are going to be then uh, closing in on the enemies first, while the second line continues to fire until if this um, group does route, then the uh, backup guys who are almost as a effective are going to then basically be the second wave um, and because there's more of them they should or they have a lower chance of um, having an HP route so that basically gives us the best chance against pretty much any province type because it ensures that we get as many shots off as possible and it's going to help us um, uh, yeah basically just have like a spread out group of guys so that we can have as much surface area as possible from what is most likely going to be numerically superior to any individual squad of indie troops um, so that's our um, bless, our overall strategy with regards to our troops um, and the expansion. Um, and then as far as research goes, because we have our pretender awake, we can start doing some researching. So we're definitely always going to want to go to Blood 4 first. That's going to let us spend whatever blood slaves we do get on our Jaguar Fiends. Uh, once we do have Blood 4, then we're going to work on increasing the efficiency of our blood hunting. Um, there's two important things for doing that. One is getting efficient patrollers with uh, Summon Wolves in Conjuration 2, and then the second thing is going to be getting uh, Dousing Rods at Construction 4. Um, Construction 4 first is actually something that a lot of people do because they want to use um, recruitable uh, patrollers, but because this build has terrible scales, um, we want to try to avoid spending money on patrollers whenever possible. Um, additionally, because we are going to be recruiting pretty much only um, mages and not really using our tribal kings or priest kings at all, um, we're not going to be uh, doing very much slave raising. Uh, so as a result, we're basically not going to want to or we're basically going to want to get the efficient um, patrolling option from Conjuration 2 out as soon as possible, even if that does mean uh, delaying how quickly we get our dousing rods in construction. Um, the other thing is that Conjuration 2 comes online much more quickly than um, construction does, and it also means that if we want, we can uh, take our Conjuration 1 further to get uh, summon jaguars, um, in case we do desperately need to spend our um, nature gems on sacreds more quickly. Um, however, if we can get construction to four first, then that's um, a little bit better basically just because it means that we can uh, reinvest our blood slaves into those dousing rods, which will very quickly pay for themselves and allow us to get a much better flow of blood slaves in order to increase our um, jaguar fiend production. Uh, so that is our uh, research, and uh, that is turn one. This is turn two of Sunday Blitz. Uh, we have declared our scout to be our prophet. Um, it seems that Tian Chi is, uh, has profited a noble, and Helheim has also profited their scout. Tian Chi actually did rename their noble, um, but Helheim hasn't renamed theirs, and Turnanog has not declared a prophet yet. Uh, let's go ahead and check out our blind expansion attempt. So this is kind of interesting in that um, we actually managed to hit a very easy province. Uh, so these are 
uh, militia with light infantry in front of them, and then archers uh, way over there in the corner. Um, so because the uh, light infantry and militia move at roughly the same speed, they both have uh, combat, or the militia have combat speed 12 and the light infantry have, has combat speed 11, they're not going to be separating by all that much. Um, and the archers are going to start firing, but because these guys all have shields, they are relatively resistant to the archer fire. So it seems like these guys uh, managed to get ahead of those guys somehow, so uh, something got messed up in the scripting there, um, since I'm pretty sure I had set them all to hold and fire. Um, but they're still doing okay, and they're just lobbing rocks at these guys. These guys also have a little bit of protection, um, but the militia do not have shields. Um, Neither do the light infantry, I don't think. Let's see if I can find some. Uh, yes, there we go. So light infantry do have shields. They're going to be relatively resistant to the slingshots, um, but the militia themselves do not, so they're going to be taking little ticks of damage as they close in. So the militia are out relatively quickly, and a significant number of the shots are now focused on these light infantry, um, and it seems that they're going to be routing as well. So with the light infantry and militia both gone, that's enough to um, basically have an, an, a significant enough portion of their army routing to trigger morale checks, um, which then is failed by the commanders and therefore uh, the independent army as a whole. The archer squad did actually make their morale check, but since all the commanders had routed off the field, the archers soon follow. So as a result of that, even with that little mistake in the scripting, we lose only six of our warriors, and we manage to capture the province. Um, so now I'm actually going to go ahead and talk about the other players in this game, since I had, uh, didn't go over that in turn one. So um, T and Chi is, has named their pretender Arise My Ancestor. So it's pretty clear that they're going for a... Um, Ancestor Spirit Bless. Uh, that's kind of interesting, uh, since this isn't, um, or since this is something that actually got improved quite a bit from uh, Dominions 4 to Dominions 5. There's a lot of different ways that you can go about an Ancestor Spirit Bless, either by doing um, different types of on-hit effects and plus attack, so that instead of just being able to paralyze, they can actually do real damage when they hit an enemy. Um, so you can combine that with various durability blesses to make it so that the Ancestor Spirits are uh, harder to destroy while actually dealing damage when they attack. Another and kind of funnier way to do it is to give the Ancestor Spirits um, Death Explosion and or Charged Bodies, which is going to make it so that when uh, people hit the Ancestor Spirits, they take damage back. Um, the explosion one in particular is really funny because it can trigger a chain reaction given how low the hit points on the dispossessed spirits are. Um, but uh, you can make up for that by giving them fire resistance so that they don't explode. Um, so we'll, we ha we'll actually have to wait and see um, until we encounter TNG what exactly they did, um, since, like I mentioned, there's a couple different ways that you can make the ancestor spirits uh, more effective. Uh, Turnanog, it went with... Uh, uh, I can't pronounce the Gaelic, uh, Tri De Dana, uh, which is like the Ga um, the Irish uh, trinity of um, like arts and crafts gods. Uh, so there's like a god of smithing and stuff. Um, so that's most likely uh, the same build that they used in the first Blitz, which was um, an imprisoned rainbow pretender with a huge number of minor blesses, which were largely aimed at improving uh, the durability of their elves, which makes them better at expanding, um, which and it also like doubles as a thug bless because it gives them uh, plus defense, plus reinvigoration. Um, I think they had blood surge as well, and basically like other nice little things which um, help give their thugs the stats that they want, um, so that they can basically solo capture provinces uh, without even having any items, and which helps them uh, fight large numbers of units once they are geared up. Um, Helheim is running Drow and Dragons, uh, so that's almost certainly an Awake Water 10 Dragon Pretender. Um, Awake Water 10 Dragons are basically the standard build at this point for um, Helheim, Banheim, Pangaea, um, basically most uh, 
sacred oriented nations that can get a lot out of quickness because it gives them both a very strong awake expander monster and an extremely powerful incarnate bless uh, bl the blue dragons in particular or i guess dragons in general have uh, great synergy with quickness as well um, the blue dragon is the one which can take it because it has water to base um, but basically the way that it works is that the quickness gives them another round of action um, and they because they have a breath weapon attack which uh, is um, like firing once per round as all ranged attacks do. They basically get to use a breath weapon attack and a like claw slash bite ta slash tail swipe attack every round. Um, so that even though they're using a ranged attack, they're um, uh, they're fighting in melee as well most times. Um, and then because they're using that ranged attack instead of just doing melee attacks twice, they also don't build up fatigue twice as fast. Uh, so it basically gives them a huge amount of additional offense. Um, and then, of course, the Quickness Plus also increases their defense by a little bit, just so that they get scratched less often. Um, dragons uh, with Quickness, when fighting in their dominions, can take on a lot of more difficult province types. Um, because the Breath Weapon attack ignores defense, um, it's great against stuff like Heavy Cavalry. Um, and because the dragons themselves are size 6, they can take on War Elephants and other Tramplers, which are normally very dangerous. Um, so basically, they're... They're good against most difficult province types. Uh, you do want to keep them away from the super hardest province types, so like uh, large numbers of cataphracts or heavy cavalry, um, and you definitely always want to keep them away from barbarians and bone tribe provinces, because with the buff to two-handed weapons, those guys deal even more damage, uh, which means that they can kill the uh, protection-reliant dragons even more easily than they could. So. Um, because you lose the Incarnate Bless if the Awake Dragon dies, you need to be a little bit careful in that sense. So um, I never blind expand with a Water 10 Awake build anymore, just because um, if the Expander dies, then you're basically screwed because you've lost your Bless. Um, however, once you do know what you're going for, you can cherry pick the provinces, and dragons are just really excellent at clearing out, like I mentioned, uh, many of even the more difficult province types. Um, while flyers are more likely to attack rear when you use the attack rear command, and when fighting indies that almost always gets you on top of the commanders, it's actually fairly dangerous to do that with dragons against uh, heavy infantry province types, um, or provinces that have nature mages in them, which is like most tribal provinces, uh, because the nature mages can use vine arrow or tangle vines in order to ensnare your pretender, and then they're basically stuck there while they're getting beaten up by the infantry. Um, and then heavy infantry, um, can basically just mob the pretender all at once while it's um, still in melee with the commanders. So unless it gets lucky enough to take out all the commanders first, then it's basically stuck fighting both the commanders themselves, who are usually decent heavy infantry units, and of course the heavy infantry stack themselves, which is much more dangerous than if it's waiting at the corner set to fire, which then basically kills first the um, light infantry militia and so on, um, and only then fights the heavy infantry. Um, and because it's able to oftentimes route the easier infantry first, um, it's basically able to um, trigger morale checks before the heavy infantry even engage. So as a result of that, it's uh, usually safer to have the dragon set in the corner, scripted to uh, basically hold her fire a couple times and then fire closest, um, and then that basically means that it's going to be um, fighting the, light, the most lightly armored or fastest moving stuff on its own first. Um, so in the case of cavalry, that means that the cavalry is going to be engaging and taking the breath weapon attacks, which is exactly what you want. Um, and then in the case of like mixed heavy infantry and stuff, the heavy infantry will get to the fight last, which, like I mentioned, often means that they'll have taken a couple HP-triggered morale checks first. Um, so that's like just a little thing on dragon expansion now. Um, of these three, uh, Arise My Ancestors is most likely going to be going for some sort of mid-game oriented thing, um, but the sort of blesses that make Ancestor Spirits more dangerous also are going to be making their regular Sacreds more dangerous to my um, Sacreds, just because they're usually giving some sort of offensive thing, and um, oftentimes that involves some sort of elemental damage, and my Sacreds don't have any resistances to that. Um, Turninog is most likely going to be it's kind of running a scaling build, which isn't that great in the smaller blitzes, so they're most likely going to be relatively vulnerable early on. Um, but they should actually be able to expand decently well, and because they're elves, they're also capable of raiding quite well. So that means that I'll most likely have to deal with uh, lots of small raiding parties, um, or even just raiding with individual elven uh, ponies.
Uh, Helheim, on the other hand, is most likely going to be getting off to the best early start because they have both an Awake Expander and a Great Bless. So that means that in addition to the fact that they're expanding with their god themse uh, with their god itself, they're also going to be able to recruit an expansion party every turn from turn one onwards. Um, depending on how confident they are, they can potentially even um, like get an Indie Priest uh, production center near their capital and then shuffle the Indie Priest in their capital to um, rec or to pick up their sacreds, either the cavalry or the flyers, and then expand with those, while the um, while they also recruit an elven cavalry commander like a Vanyar or a... Uh, yeah, I think they're still Vanyarls, uh, from their capital, and then expand with that elf by himself, which is actually something that you can do with Water 10. Um, so they can potentially even get uh, two expansion parties per turn from their capital very early on. So these guys are going to be ballooning in size and are most likely going to be the um, biggest early game threat. Um, but for now, we're just doing our own expansion stuff, since we haven't met anyone quite yet. Given the success that we had against that first um, light infantry thing, we're going to be taking on another province, which has that same type of relatively easy indie. So we're just going to be doing the exact same thing and uh, hopefully taking on that province as well. Meanwhile, our starting army, like I would mentioned, we're going to be using the um, Nahuali to lead them and uh, have the scout provide the blessings, which is going to let these guys hold and attack rear. Um, and then, like I mentioned, hold and attack rear became much more reliable, so we're going to be able to use that to actually get onto the enemy back line and hopefully get rid of them. Uh, meanwhile, because we now need a blesser from our capital, we're going to be recruiting a Mecklen Priest. Um, and then he's going to be leading six of these guys and four regular guys. Uh, we're going to be recruiting a Feathered Warrior to help increase the morale even further. Um, but we shouldn't need necessarily need that morale boost because we already have the morale bonus on our bless. Um, but it's still nice in order to basically make sure that our squad doesn't route before um, actually getting rid of the enemies. And that's turn two.